So now let's talk about the nature of ecosystems. And as an ecologist, one of the ways that I have found that's easy, the easiest way to start studying the ecosystem is to follow the flow of energy in the ecosystem because everything that's alive needs energy. And, and we generally we get that, that source of energy is generally from the sun in most ecosystems. Um, and so that, that starts taking uh, plants and animals and putting them on what we call different trophic levels. Trophic meaning food or a feeding source. So for example, um, um, in our diagram that we have here, uh, uh, producers, plants, uh, would be uh, at the very bottom of the, of, of the food pyramid, but they're the ones that are capturing the source uh, of energy, the capturing sunlight, and, and they're going to want to be the provide it for everything up. So the plants would be producers. Anything that eats plants, it would be a type of consumer. Um, and it, depending on what you eat, exactly what you eat, if you eat just plants, you're herbivore. If you eat plants and meat, you're omnivore. If you eat, uh, if you eat uh, just meat, you're a carnivore. But every time uh, something gets, uh, gets eaten, that's a, a transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next trophic level. So some terms we talk about, we talk about the biotic parts of an ecosystem. Biotic means uh, all the living components. A biotic would mean uh, all the things that aren't living, but we're going to just look at the biotic components. Um, we said earlier that we have these producers, which are plants. They produce energy by capturing um, uh, sunlight in the process of photosynthesis and storing it as glucose. Um, anything that eats something else is a consumer. Uh, we have detritivores and decomposers. Detritivores usually eat things that are dead, uh, like dead animals, like um, for example, um, uh, uh, fly larvae, maggots eat, uh, eat carrion, they, they eat um, things that are dead. Um, vultures, uh, other types of beetles and worms, they usually break down dead things. And those would be detritivores, that's, anything that's dead is called detritus. Um, and then decomposers break down the organic molecules and kind of return them to the soil. So lots of bacteria and fungus, those are generally decomposers. They would decompose the remains of, of, of living things and, and break them back down and recycle those nutrients back into the soil. And so whenever we start talking about following uh, the energy flow, we have to use these terms. We have to know what we're talking about, like what's eating what, and, and, and that helps us keep in mind of where they are on their, their energy flow, on the energy pyramid, on, on our food pyramid. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's one way of starting to approach uh, an ecosystem and studying how it, it, it works and what we expect to find in an ecosystem. So generally when we talk about eating other things, uh, we talk about food chains and food webs. And there's a difference between the two, right? And here's kind of like how I, I think of it. So a food chain shows what did eat what, but a food web shows what could eat what. So think of it like a, a food web is like a menu. You're looking at the menu, all the things that you could eat. You're not going to eat all of them. You're going to pick one or two things off of there to eat at a time. And next time you come, you have the same menu, but you may choose something different. So here is a menu. Let's say, uh, what does this show us? This is just what could eat what. So what could eat the butterfly? Well, according to this, it could be eaten by the frog or it could be eaten by the dragonfly. What could the wolf eat? Well, he could eat the rat or he could eat the thrush. So there's, there's lots of different things on, on here that, that could be eating, but we're not saying what did eat what. We're saying this is what could eat what. So this is like a menu, right? So that's going to be our food web. Food chains show what did eat what. So in this case, what did this mouse eat? Well, he had corn. He had a bunch of different things he could have eaten, but he did eat this corn. What did the owl eat? He ate the mouse. Good job. What did the lion eat? Good. He ate the fox. Uh, what did the frog eat? Well, good. He ate the grasshopper. Okay, so this isn't saying, saying what could eat what. This is saying what did eat eat what. And that's the big difference between a food chain and a food web. So looking at the nature of the ecosystem, when we start talking about these producers and consumers, we have kind of generalization, uh, generalized terms that we'll give these guys. We have specific terms that we'll give them too. So you could say something's a consumer, but what type of consumer is it? Well, we have primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quaternary, and on up, but generally we just stay within the primary, secondary, tertiary for our examples that we'll use. So 
anything that produces energy for us, any type of plant, anything that goes through photosynthesis, plants and some type of uh, photosynthetic uh, um, uh, bacteria, those are producers. If you eat a producer, you're what we call a primary consumer, right? So you're eating plants. So at some point in time, you function as a primary consumer as well because you eat plants at some point, an apple, an orange, a salad, um, maybe just fall on the grass, grass and start eating it. Who knows? But that's going to be a primary consumer. Anything that eats a uh, primary consumer eat something that ate grass, at that moment, they're functioning as a secondary consumer. If something eats a secondary consumer, they're considered to be a tertiary consumer and so forth and so on. So let's give an example. So let's say um, the grass is eaten by a cow. The cow would be, it is a herbivore because it, uh, it only eats grass. Cows don't really eat meat, so they're herbivores. Uh, but in that instance, the cow is functioning as a primary consumer because it's eating plants. Now let's say a human comes along and eats the cow. In that instant, we are functioning as a secondary consumer because we are eating the cow that ate the grass. Now if we turn around and eat lettuce, at that point in time, we're functioning as a primary consumer because we are eating a, a producer. Um, so it depends on wh what you're eating at that particular time. Now let's say, um, uh, well, let's say a, uh, a bear comes along and eats the human. Well, if you're following it from the human ate the cow, the human would be a secondary consumer. If the bear eats the human, that would make the bear a tertiary consumer, right? And so forth and, and, and so on all the way up the food, uh, the food chain. And, and that's kind of where we get the idea for this food pyramid. But why is this pyramid shaped the way it is? Why, is it just, why does it get smaller as it gets to the top? Well, there's this whole thing called uh, the, the second law of thermodynamics. First law of thermodynamics says you can't get something for nothing. Second law of thermodynamics says you can't even get what you pay for. What that means for us is that when you eat something, you're not getting 100% of the energy that was, that was inside of that thing that you ate. A lot of the energy that you take in is going to be lost as heat. Um, and that's just part of our metabolic process. 90% of what you ingest energy-wise is simply lost. It's not stored and used by your body for anything. It's just lost. But, you know, organic matter is very inefficient <laughs> at, at, at storing and keeping energy uh, or, or, or keeping energy before it can store it. We lose a lot of it just in, in our normal body processes. So it's not energy used for running, jumping, skipping, hopping, uh, reproducing. Uh, it's not stored as fat. It's not used to study for biology. That's not that energy. This is the, the, the energy you use for all that is the 10% that you keep. So 90% of what you eat, energy-wise, is lost. Every time something gets eaten, there's a little less energy. So that's why we have this shape as a pyramid. There's a lot of energy available at producers, right? That's kind of like our 100%. Every time you go up a step, you're losing 90%. Um, and so forth and so on. That explains why we see very few top predators because there's not enough energy from the level of what they're feeding to support a large number of them. Excuse me, wh why do we only see um, more herbivores in areas? You turn on the National Geographic Channel, Discovery Channel, and you see the Serengeti. Tons of grass all over the place. And there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelle. Why? Because there's tons of grass. There's slightly fewer um, herbivores, but there's still a bunch of them. But you don't see 10,000 lions roaming around out there, right? No, you don't see that many because every time you go up a level, you're losing 90% of the energy that was in that system. And so you see very few top predators as you get to the top. So if I went to a place and I can kind of, I can, I can using this, I can kind of predict what I'll see. If there's not a, if there's, if there's tons of grass, I would expect to see a lot of herbivores, and I'd, I'd expect to see a, a good number of top predators. But if I walked into an ecosystem that didn't have a lot of grass, that didn't had a lot of, of plants uh, available, it's mostly rock, kind of barren, I would expect to see very few herbivores and probably extremely few, if no, top predators simply because there's not, enough, there's not enough energy in that ecosystem to support 
a top predator. Why? Because 90% of what we eat losses heat. If you're feeding from way up high, you're, you're, you're just not going to be able to get that much energy. There won't be enough energy available to sustain a large population. And that's one of the great things that we can learn by uh, uh, studying ecosystems and studying how things feed and, and, and applying that law of thermodynamics uh, to those systems. And um, I think that's a great way to study ecosystems, just for me, at least. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lecture. I hope that you've learned something, and I will see you uh, next time. Bye.